Okay, I'm ready. <clears throat> Greetings. Uh, this is lecture three of Shockwave Physics One, or listed as ENPM 681. So I hope you had a good time doing the homework, and uh, we'll have some more for you, which uh, we have here on the on the slide, and. Uh, Excuse me. We want you to finish uh, problem 2.6, which was the derivation of the two uh, step shockwave equations. That was not made clear on, on the uh, previous listing. So that I'm giving you two weeks to do, not just one. So the main interest in that is I really want to see if you know how to set it up right. The algebra for the first two is probably straightforward. The energy equation can be real tricky. Uh, I've had uh, students and myself spend four pages of algebra before I got it right on the energy. If you go the right direction in the first step, it goes in just three or four steps. But if you don't, it becomes really a lot of uh, just algebra. Really not interested in seeing if you can get through the algebra, wanting to see if you can set it up. So. Uh, with that said, the other problems I want you to do are problems 3.3 three and 3.6. This is going to help you in the impedance matching uh, problems that we're really going to get into because uh, that's, that's what I mentioned in the first lecture. What we really want is to have you be able to design an experiment within uh, at least a simple shockwave experiment within the first four lectures or after the fourth lecture. I'm pretty sure that can be done, so, uh, uh, but to do that we have to go through material pretty fast. And so that's one thing we're doing. Also I want to remind you that uh, the, the best way to send me homework is by an email if that's feasible, but if it turns out that it's something you really need to fax and instead of scan and send as an email, you can send it to me at this fax number. But remember to always send me an email that you had faxed it. My particular fax uh, machine, if it gets jammed, it does not save the message, and then I have no idea what was sent. So by you sending an email saying that you sent whatever homework it is or whatever you've uh, faxed me, then I will be looking for it. If it doesn't show up, I'll make contact with you right away. Just makes us connect a little better since we don't really meet in a classroom. So, uh, this is the same information. Just uh, you know, here's my email address and the fax number. So make sure you have that because that's the only two ways you can get homework to me. Homework is going to uh, most likely be at least a third of the grade, so uh, uh, you do need to submit it if you're taking the class for a grade. My philosophy is that I can lecture, show you that I know how to do the problems, but unless you really try, uh, it doesn't sink in. I, uh, this is years of experience telling me this. So I really do want you to try the, the homework so you can uh, internalize it and and be able to reproduce it because if you were out in the field doing experiments as a shockwave physicist, uh, these are some of the things you have to do. And so this is a very practical course from that viewpoint. You can see that I, I use a tablet computer and I, after reviewing the first lecture, or the first two, I noticed that I tend to go a little fast when I'm writing on the board or on the screen. So I'm going to try to slow down so that it really comes across better. And I'll try to also be a little neater, which is going to be the big challenge, because uh, that's one reason I go f I have a 
habit of going writing fast, and of course then it's not as legible as it should be. So I, I'm going to attempt to do that, but once I get into a subject, sometimes I get uh, just moving through it and, and uh, don't slow down. So. I'm going to start, as I, as I mentioned also before, is that I want the homework in. We will grade it, but it's a self-graded homework because I want you to really have a set of uh, homework problems that have correct solutions. So I will present to you af uh, in a lecture after the, they're assigned what the solutions are so that we can go over them and you can actually see if you did it right or if you didn't, where the problem in your solution would be. That's more important to me than, than just getting a, a piece of paper for a grade. I'm really wanting you to understand the material, so that's why I do it this way. Uh, but you do have to get the homework in, so we will grade it and keep uh, the grades. Uh, but you will get the solutions after the fact. So. In that regard, problem 2-2, I had changed in the, in the, uh, from my notes to where I put it in the draft book that you have. Uh, it's only a slight change. I changed the linear USUP for a copper to a more modern fit of that data, as well as its density. And it gives the same answers that you, uh, that you got in, if you, you uh, did the one that was posted earlier in the, or in the book. So um, it turns out that, I'm sorry, if, if the solution I showed in class two was a problem slightly different than the one that was posted in, in, the, in the book. Although it was close enough, the answers were the, the same uh, in the you know, fourth decimal or something. So, so, but I'm going to go quickly through that just to show you that this, these highlighted uh, numbers are the ones that change from the was, is listed in 2.2 in the, in the book. But they're close enough to what's, um, I, that, that was in, in the lecture. I keep confusing it. I put it in the lecture with the, and I solved the wrong problem. Uh, this is the right problem from the book. So I wanted to go through it. And again, um, let's go through the solution. Well, if you have a linear relationship between the shock velocity and the particle velocity, which is here, and I'm asking you, what is the particle velocity if I give you the steady shock wave velocity of 0.6 centimeter a microsecond? And when I don't say the coordinate system, you assume Larian or lab, which are the same. So it's very simple. You just stick in the 0.6 uh, in the equation, you and solve it. Just simple algebra. Just wanted to make sure uh, that you get used to some of the the uh, equations that we use often. Actually, now the you just stick stick it in the equation and solve for it and. Uh, Let's see. Actually, I see that I have an error on this. So just on this one here, so because of units. So I'm going to go right on. At least I think I have an error. And again, the same thing on the uh, pressure equation. You just stick the values in that you have, and you come up with the answer. Again, it's the same answer as before. And the compression is this equation. It's U, uh, uh, shock velocity minus particle velocity over the shock velocity. And if you stick that equation, uh, those numbers in, you get a compression of 0.7695, which is V over V naught for that shock. <clears throat> the energy 
Again, it's just the energy equation, and it's, again, a direct substitution of numbers, so I, I'm not going to uh, really go over that. I used consistent units up to this point, then I wanted you to convert it. So converting it from megabar centimeter cubed to uh, joules is it one megabar centimeter cube is 10 to the fifth uh, joules. So it's a straightforward conversion. And calorie, uh, there's 4.186 joules per calorie. So that's another very simple conversion. And again, th th these are simple equations just to get you used to the units and the conversion factors that you might be, uh, need, rather than to challenge you in, in any problem at this point. Believe me, all problems aren't going to be this simple. Uh, the problem E is a little more interesting in that if you notice, if you substitute in the uh, jump equation for pressure, and you substitute in the linear expression for uh, For US, you get a quadratic. <clears throat> so, there, you know, everyone knows the solution of a quadratic, so the particle velocity can be obtained then from the parameters that uh, were given you. This would be the probably the best way to solve this problem. You can see that I just uh, solved UP and it's 0.0483 centimeters per microsecond. But I had to use consistent units. That's another thing. Again, you always have to use that set of consistent units. Otherwise, you're going to get the wrong answer. Another way of doing this problem, of course, is that you could just pick um, a value of, of UP. You know, you can iterate, essentially. So you could uh, just pick a value of UP and see if it comes up to 200 kilobars. And, and just iterate till you get it. And it usually doesn't take too long for you to do that. I mean, you substitute it, the UP into the uh, shock, get the shock velocity and then, and then the pressure, or you use this equation, whatever, um, and just iterate. But you can solve it directly and get a very accurate answer if you use a quadratic solution as shown here. Okay, now we're gonna go and go over uh, classroom, you know, class two's homework that I assign, except for the der uh, derivation of the two-wave jump equation. What we're going to do here is, is go over this problem. It's two plane one-dimensional shock waves are propagating in the same direction in, in pure iron. We're treating iron as a fluid, so we're saying there's no yield strength or, or uh, wave due to that. So. Uh, at high pressures, you can do this. If you're working at high pressures, that you can ignore the fact that it actually has a small yield uh, point. Uh, in the solids uh, chapter, in semester, uh, next semester when I get into solids, we'll actually treat it totally correctly. But the air is so small that you can ignore it by if you're at pressures, you know, a couple hundred kilobars or so. And since I already made the assumption that we're going to treat the uh, things as fluids in this first semester, unless I note differently. So, <clears throat> so we're going to use the equations then and solve the, uh, the, the parameters. So we have initial condition is uh, pressure zero, initial volume, and the particle motion is zero in, ahead of the first shock. And it's traveling at a lab velocity or Eulerian velocity at 5.1 millimeter microsecond. And the pressure in that wave is 131 kilobars. And the other travel, uh, wave is traveling at 0.36 millimeter a microsecond. Actually, Actually, it was centimeter a microsecond here, so it's really it's really 3.6 millimeter a microsecond. I wasn't as careful as I should have been. But uh, 
This, I'm pretty sure I did it correctly when I used that value because I, I would have recognized the magnitude was wrong. This is where the confusion of using uh, non-consistent units. The reason we use uh, millimeter or microsecond is notice that velocities are come out in whole numbers. If you use centimeters per microsecond, it's always 0.51, in this, say, in this case. But I clearly demonstrated how you could get confused easily if you write it down wrong. So, well, for the first problem is, we don't, of course, we don't use this wave for this first part here. We're only using the parameter for the first wave. And so for what, what is the particle velocity, uh, what's the compression, and the energy change for this first shock wave? Remember, we have, essentially, we're going to have two shock waves, one following the other, and the state in the front over here is where it's P equals zero. And this is the shock wave one, and this is shock wave two. So we're just working on shock wave one. Well, it's just a single uh, wave equation, which uh, we've derived in class. You just solve that for particle velocity and substitute in, and you find that the and here I'm using consistent units. So I, I find that the particle velocity is 0.0326 centimeters a microsecond for that first shock wave. That's the velocity, the particle mass vo uh, velocity behind that first wave. And for the energy, I'm sorry, here, uh, the, the compression, which is the next step, of course, is just this equation. And again, a direct substitution uh, in the equation. And in this case, I actually used and, uh, millimeter a microsecond because the units cancel out. I probably should have uh, used centimeter a microsecond, but I'm so used to knowing that uh, for compression, you know, it's if I use millimeter a microsecond in uh, all these cases, uh, then, then I'll be okay. So, uh, okay, well, let me go on. And if I have an error in this, I'm going to look at this again. I see that I should have done this in consistent units, but hopefully you have. The point is that if I made a slight error, at least you see a simple way of doing it. Again, this is just exercising the two-wave equation. And uh, so what I'm doing here is now going to the second wave. And that's the two-wave jump equation. And we wanted to know the particle velocity, the volume, compression, and the energy change. And Again, we just solved this equation for U2. Just solve it for U2 and, and substitute in, and I get 0 0.0502 centimeter a microsecond it's for that value. The, um, And I'm using consistent units. I think, I, like I said, I may have had one slight unit problem in the last one. But uh, this one looks OK. And again, for the volume now, is uh, remember that it's the it's u2 minus little u2. I guess I didn't write that down. But uh, if you remember from the the book, uh, when you have two waves, you're going from this over U2, the shock velocity minus the initial velocity in front. And that's all I've done here, and I get 0.9462 for that compression. The second shock wave compresses the material that's already compressed. It's in the pressure state P1. Uh, so, but it, this adds more compression. In fact, this is the factor right here that we get from from the jump 
two-wave uh, jump equation. And the energy across the uh, second shock with the, uh, ha uh, the, the reference state for in front is, of course, this, the state behind the first shock, because E1. So this is the energy behind the second shock. And that's, of course, just the jump equation again that's in the book. And it's this equation, P2 plus P1 times V1 minus V2 over 2. Just substituting it in, you'll get uh, 1, 1 1.051 times 10 to the minus 3 megabar centimeter cubes per gram. So again, it's just substitution. But again, we uh, it's important. This equation actually turns out to be very important which will be part of the lecture also. So uh, I'll be going over and showing you how to use this equation to determine uh, magnitudes of Valerian velocities, actually. <clears throat> and part C is just what is the volume uh, for, uh, relative to the uh, the in front of the first shock, what is the compression compared to the initial volume? And if you notice that it's just the two compressions timed each other that we've calculated, because the V1, you know, cancels out. See the V1 here and the V here cancels out, so it becomes V2 over V0. So if you just multiply the two, then you get a total compression from initial state of V0 all the way to behind the second shock of 0.8857. And that's a pretty good compression, actually, of the material, the solid material. And again, we do a very similar thing to get the energy, the total energy from the initial state behind the second shock is just the subtraction of the two energies, uh, delta E's. And it turns out to be uh, 5.204 times 10 to the minus fourth megabar centimeter cubed per gram. And I'd also then ask what is in, do some conversion. In the literature, and the only reason I do this is that a lot of, the, a lot of people have switched to the other uh, coordinate system in, uh, where gigapascal uh, is, is really the pressure unit. And so, that being the case, you'll see lots of papers uh, reporting the pressure in gigapascal, so you need to be able to convert it from uh, megabars or kilobars fairly easily uh, so that you don't get confused. And it's, the conversion factor is really pretty simple. One gigapascal, uh, you know, gig is ten, you know, 10 to the ninth, so it's a large number, but a, but a gigapascal is equal to 0 0.01 megabar. So the 200 ki uh, kilobar uh, pressure, or it becomes 20 gigapascals uh, for the second shock. And of course, the first shock is 13.1 uh, gigapascal instead of 131 kilobar, uh, or a 0 0.131 megabar whatever way you looked at it. Uh, but also since one megabar centimeter cube, again, is 10 to the fifth joules, um, you can see that the energy would be 52.04 joules, which can be converted then into 12.44 uh, uh, calories. So, and actually, this should have been O, I believe. I see that uh, it's a little sloppy in my notation. I'll have to clean that up because that's what I asked for here. So I'm pretty sure I used the right one for this. But again, it's, this is not a, uh, it's just a units issue on this one. Here's, <clears throat> let me go over problem 3.1. It's a little more difficult. But it's very practical. If you're doing an experiment, I've mentioned already that you need to do 
what's called an XT diagram and a PU diagram. When you do are doing that, that's called impedance matching. That allows you to design an experiment or even interpret an experiment with plain one-dimensional shocks that are uh, being used. So sometimes you don't have to do real accurate uh, pictures to get get a feeling for what's going to happen. But other times when you're wanting to set up scopes or cameras that only have short uh, windows uh, where you can capture data, you need these to be accurate. So they're very practical and very important for the experimentalist. So let's look at this problem. There's two plates. They're in contact. You know, just You know, the different materials. This is material one. I guess I could just put one and two in here. This would be ma Let's see, the plate, this is I. And the plate on the right is, is double I. And a shock is introduced in the far left boundary. Let, you know, we could hit this boundary here with a flyer plate or, or put an explosive on it. Uh, we don't need to know how that was generated, but a shock enters this boundary uh, the, on material uh, uh, Roman numeral I, one, actually, uh, not I, but it enters that material, and what we'd like to do is find out the history of that shock wave as it goes through uh, these two samples. And remember, actually, when uh, the shock reaches the boundary, there's going to be a reflection, a wave going back, actually. We, we've already gone over this uh, once, so, and, and the rule for impedance matching. So we know that the uh, shock comes in, and then it actually, an, another wave goes back after it hits this boundary. And also, a, wa a wave goes forward into the second material, a shock wave. So what we want to do is actually do an XT diagram. Remember, and, and actually, well, it's, a, I guess, a TX. We always put the X down here because it's like, in a sense, you can see these parallel plates up here. Uh, the, sh the motion this way is X, so that's why we, we always uh, try our TX diagrams. I'm, not, I'm in the habit of calling them XT, but it's really TX, I guess. But this would be time, and this would be the one direction that we can have motion in this uh, one-dimensional uh, shock wave. And so what we want to do is uh, find out, here would be maybe uh, material one, and here would be material two. Well, we know a shock comes in, it hits this boundary, and then it, something reflects, another wave reflects off of that. And a wave goes into this material. And this, this material has a boundary over here, and it's, it'll reflect a uh, wave when it reaches that. What we want to do is map all that so that we actually know the times that, uh, accurately when this is happening. And we also have to remember that the plates, the, the interface between the plates in Larian coordinates do not stay fixed. Once the shock wave goes through it, that boundary will move at the particle motion behind the shock in, in the uh, second material, or at the boundary. Okay, so I give you the details. I, I'm actually wanting you to have experience in the XT diagrams before we really go through all of the, the impedance matching because we've got to start somewhere uh, with the material, and you need both to understand it. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and tell you that in a Larian co uh, or lab coordinates, uh, the, the forward-facing first shock is 5 millimeter a microsecond. And uh, 
the left boundary for I moves to the right with a velocity of 0.8. So that's going to be this boundary. This is the initial boundary. Let me go another color. But after the shock enters it, it's going to be going a certain velocity. And remember the the slope of these lines, this is 1 over 0.8. Now in an XT diagram, you can use millimeter microseconds or centimeter microseconds as long as you stay consistent. Um, so I, I did mine in millimeter microseconds uh, because all I'm looking for is the time in, in the XT diagram. Well, the forward-facing wave, I'm giving you all the information, is that it has 8 millimeter a microsecond. Well, that means this is 1 over 8, the slope of that, in millimeter a microsecond. So you've, what you need to do is then plot it and find out when it arrives at this boundary. Uh, the backward-facing wave, the one here, I give you a minus. It has to be minus, remember, it's going from right to left, so that means it's a, and it's a vector uh, velocity. So anything going from right to left has to have a negative sign in front of it. So I'm just not worried about uh, the particle motion. I just uh, corrected and gave you the, the Larian velocity of minus 4 uh, millimeter microsecond for this, for this wave here you know, the one that's going back off the boundary. I guess I should use a highlighter instead. You know, this wave here. So I give that velocity. And the interface between 1 and 2 is a half a millimeter microsecond. So that's what this slope would be. But it starts, at, it starts um, down here, though, at that point. So you have to uh, plot it from that point with the, with the slope of a straight line of 0.5 millimeter microsecond. And once we reach the free surface, actually that moves off at a velocity to the right. This being the free surface, initially, as soon as that wave arrives, the uh, free surface moves. And that velocity is one millimeter a microsecond. It's a very practical thing is that one of the easy ways to determine particle motion is to measure the free surface velocity. And you can do that with cameras and, and, uh, or pens, rival pens that are spaced out in front of it as the plate moves and hits the pins, uh, it tells you the velocity as they close the pins. So that's it, uh, the free surface velocity is going to be a useful parameter in, in a number of experiments. Also, I give you the plate's thickness. And so uh, the first plate is 20 millimeters thick. And uh, this plate, too, is only 16 millimeters thick. So this problem was uh, probably a little bit of a challenge since this is the first time I've actually had you put real numbers in it and, and try something. But again, I think just learning how to do this is very important. And without you trying it on your own and seeing uh, some of the uh, subtleties of, of the solution, uh, it wouldn't have helped you. So this is one reason I gave it to you a little earlier than than, uh, than presenting everything that I normally present. So, and I told you if you were going to do it by hand, and I know most, most of you don't do things by hand anymore uh, with graph paper, but if you did, I, I saved you a little time by telling you the, uh, a convenient uh, scale to use. You could use whatever you want as long as it's, you know, make, it's something that you can get answers off of. Uh, if you're using 
a graphing program such as uh, Excel, which is what I use, then you use whatever uh, scale that, that really makes the graph look good as well as uh, covers, the graph should cover at least two-thirds of the paper on the Excel screen or the, or the graph at least. You don't want a real tiny graph. So it's, that's subjective. But, but anyhow, I tried to give a little hint there. This is just the beginning of what, how you would start the problem. Uh, this is just this first wave in plate uh, one. Remember, see that first of all what we have is with real numbers now, <clears throat> let's see, let's try that. Um, with real numbers, here's the time, here's the distance, and this is uh, the problem that I actually gave you. The first shock velocity was five millimeter microsecond. Um, oh, that's not going good with that. I'll go back to my yellow. Um, in this case, I did use the consistent units, 0.5 centimeter microsecond. Now, and one over that velocity is a slope, and in this case, the easy, it starts at uh, the zero, zero point because that's where you, you get to choose where it starts whenever you do it, but it's always convenient to have the first point at zero, zero. <clears throat> and it draws a straight line, and it goes to the, where the uh, boundary is between one and two. And therefore, it's quick and easy to see that, well, it, only, it took four microseconds at that velocity to go the two centimeters. So that's one of the answers that, that on the problem. But it gets a little more complicated because of some of these particle motions. Because remember, once the shock reaches this boundary, this boundary actually moves off at the particle velocity behind the shock that goes, you know, there'll be a shock going in here and it'll have a particle velocity behind it, and that's the velocity that the uh, interface actually will uh, travel. So I've already done the uh, XT diagram by hand, but let me do it again. So it's always useful to do this bef uh, by hand uh, without numbers because you can solve a lot of issues ahead of time. So let's go back and, and see what we have. We have two plates, and I'll draw them without numbers. This would be T, this would be X. We introduce a shock that comes in, hits this boundary. This is, this is material one, this is material two, and can't remember if this, I think this is a higher impedance material, but it, a wave is reflected back, which I, in this direction, and there's a wave that goes over to this surface. So the shock comes in, goes off of this boundary, uh, this boundary here between them, and the shock goes forward into here. But one other thing is, is important, two other things that are important for XT diagram uh, that you need to know, and that is that once a shock moves through the material and you have a boundary, such as here's a boundary, this is the initial boundary, and here's another boundary between the two materials, once the shock goes in past that boundary, that boundary See, this is drawn here as a stationary boundary, but it, once the shock goes there, it actually isn't. It actually moves at a velocity that is one over the particle velocity of the, of the wave going in there. And the same thing happens on this boundary. Now we have This boundary no longer, oops, I don't know why it did that. I didn't want that, so I may have to just 
you have to go back and get to where I was at. Okay. <clears throat> so this boundary, uh, once the sh this shock here goes into it, well, this boundary starts moving. And it's moving at the particle velocity behind this shock in uh, here, in this material. So if, let's call that shock U2, I made you call it something different than the other solution. So this would be 1 over little u2, whatever the uh, particle motion behind that is. So your boundaries don't stay uh, stationary in the Larian coordinates or lab coordinates. And that's the thing that really is why you have to do it accurate uh, to get the timing right. Because otherwise you just could draw straight lines and, and it would be simple. But the fact that since the boundaries move, because mass moves at, uh, behind a shock, you have to take that into account. And again, that's another reason I wanted to introduce that, and I thought this problem could introduce it uh, as, as in a usable sense. Here it actually is the solution of this problem with all questions on it. And so I'm, you can look at this and see that, well, here... Here's the point where it intersects, and that's we already did that once before. And notice we have the shock reflected, and it's going back, and it reaches this boundary that is moving. At the here's the particle motion behind this first shock. Here, this first shock has a particle motion of 0.08 centimeters a microsecond. So. This boundary moves that uh, with slope one over that. When that uh, reaches this shock, uh, then there's another reflection of a wave. But I don't have the problem going any further than that. So that would be the answer when the reflected uh, wave off of the first boundary here reaches the back boundary over here uh, is going to be 7.46 microseconds. Now when you go from this point to the second, the free surface, because out here is a free surface, there's no plate, it's just the vacuum um, past, you know, past this point actually is a vacuum. Well this is just a shock going, a single shock going in this material with slope of the of the uh, uh, eight tenths of a centimeter microsecond or eight millimeter microsecond, which is pretty fast, uh, but that tells you when that shock arrives at the free surface, so you can get that. And I don't ask you to actually do anything else, but you do notice over here that this boundary, this initial boundary between them, was at two, that it's because the shock is in this, this material over here, in material two, this boundary moves, like I said, and you can account for that motion. So this is, this is a little bit of a difficult problem for you uh, at this stage in the class, but I wanted you to really see the solution and see where things that you're really going to have to focus on to understand and so I've used this to teach you or show you uh, how these boundaries move because most people, again, forget that and think of things that are stationary. And in shock waves, if you're using Larian or lab coordinates, uh, once a shock wave moves, the mass particles move and therefore the boundaries move. So uh, it, relative to your co fixed coordinate system outside that. So this, this problem had a lot of... Uh, things in it, and I, I anticipate that, you know, the, the, you've learned some new things that you didn't uh, have in your toolbox uh, 
before trying this problem. So what I ask you to do is go back and see if this makes sense to you and, and, and uh, draw it out again. It's just so you can get the idea of uh, what we're doing here and the fact that the boundaries move and you can specify with the solution what they are. And this is going to be useful uh, for the shockwave person uh, doing experiments. Uh, this is what you really need to do before you do an experiment. You have to design it with an XT diagram and, and to get the pressures and uh, with it, you do a PU diagram. When you do both together and map them together, that is called impedance matching. And we're going to go through more details on that, but I thought useful to give you this problem so you actually could see some of the things that you really have to take and uh, learn. So, And I did ask what are the time for, uh, the first forward shock reaches this interface and that's four microseconds. Forward facing shock reached the second materials was six and the backward facing shock off of the boundary uh, reaching the back boundary, which was again was moving, and that's seven four six. The truth is these two answers were simple because things were stationary uh, ahead of them, so those were just straightforward distance divided by velocity. Uh, this one you had to worry about that one boundary moving, otherwise you would not get the right answer. So. Uh, Okay, so that's it on the homework. And again, I realize that that was probably a challenging problem for you, uh, but we need to really get into the point where we actually can do problems and, and XT diagrams like that. Many times you would always do a XT diagram without numbers just to sort of make sure that you know where the waves are reflecting and, and uh, if there's interfaces or, or whatever. And you can learn a lot by doing that without the numbers, but if you're really doing an experiment and you need to know <clears throat> wave arrivals at different boundaries, you have to do it accurately. And so that was your first uh, exposure to that. Okay, I think it's good to go ahead and uh, review some concepts that we talked about in the first two lectures just to make sure that everyone is on board on, on what they are. <clears throat> first of all, the, the principal Hugonio is a unique Hugonio. It's the one where uh, If it's a PV, it's the one that starts at V naught, P naught equals zero, V, v naught and P naught or P equals zero. Starts at this point on the graph where this would be zero pressure. And if you were doing looking at that on a PU diagram, which remember shock, you can map PV into PU, which is really a PU is more useful because it's where the boundary conditions are. It would be this, and this would be the particle motion on this axis, pressure on this axis. But again, it starts at uh, particle motion zero, pressure equals zero. That's called a principal Hugonio. So it's really the you go near where the initial state ahead of it is zero pressure, zero particle motion, and initial volume. And the reason I say that is that that's what's always given, or almost always given in the, the textbooks or the literature when you're looking up a Hugonio. But, but there are other Hugonios that are not principal Hugonios when you're doing impedance matching. And so you need to know the difference and, and be able to uh, treat uh, a reflected Hugonio, which would be different than a, uh, the principal Hugonio. It may actually have symmetry like it, but just you can't always just use a principal Hugonio if, if the problem has different directions in it. 
And that's going to become very clear uh, before we get through with the lecture here. Uh, what I'm talking about is that but just remember that, if, that the, the principal Hugonio is what you find listed as a, a Hugonio for materials in the literature. Uh, and you will need to know other Hugonios based on the other initial states to do impedance matching. And that's what we're going to learn how to do that under the assumptions of impedance matching. Okay, another thing is that we want to uh, really talk about is to understand the two-wave shock uh, equation for pressure, mainly because uh, there's a difference between velocities and, and one Velocity in lab coordinates it can be different from uh, velocity than you that you would get from an equation of state. The, the uh, equation of state uh, velocities are called uh, well, I call them disturbance velocities, and so you you have to be clear that they're not always the same as the shock velocity if if you're getting it from an equation of state. Uh, that'll become a little clearer, too. What I'm saying is, remember, in the Larian coordinates, we've talked about that if the particle motion is in front of it, you have to add or subtract the velocity, depending on its direction, uh, to get the Larian velocity. This was the, the runner on the train example I gave you. But in a practical sense, if you really just look at it, if you can't remember which way to do the problem, whether you add or subtract, you can always come back to this jump equation here and uh, realize that, let me do this, that this value here in this equation is the disturbance velocity of a shock. This is for shocks only. I'll talk about uh, release waves in, uh, next. But f So if you wanted to know what the shock uh, velocity in Larian coordinates is, it, it is this, the, U, the U2. That is the, the magnitude. But in, a, in the jump equation, it actually corrects for the particle motion. So the disturbance velocity, which you might get from another uh, equation of state or, or something, or maybe even the principal Hugonio, but there is a motion in front of the uh, uh, Hugonio it would be like a flyer plate impacting another flyer plate. This actually happens. So remember that that term in the equation here is a disturbance velocity. The real Eulerian velocity is this, and that's what you have to always make sure you determine because you have to uh, use the Eulerian uh, velocity in this equation for it to come out right. You're going to find that uh, no, if, once you know this uh, equation fairly well, this is going to help you decide whether you add or subtract to uh, the particle motion to make the, uh, to a disturbance velocity, to, ma to make the Eulerian velocity magnitude. Uh, that's going to be the trick. So, and we will go over some problems where there's symmetry, so we know the answer due to symmetry, and we'll show how the equations show that. Okay, so this equation, even though it's, uh, it is the two-wave equation, it tells us the pressure, and it also gives us clues on, on what we have to, what the Eulerian velocity uh, has to be. <clears throat> because of the, because of this pressure equation has to have the disturbance velocity in it, the U2 minus U1. And so you can determine the, the magnitude of U2 sometimes by just looking at this equation and realizing uh, that, that uh, which, whether you have to add or subtract of a value to, to a number you have, like a disturbance vel velocity to get the lab velocity. Uh, you'll need examples where you really do that to get that. I understand that, but remember, this, this equation is more useful than just getting pressure. It actually keeps uh, 
you're you're straight on the magnitudes of of the uh, velocities in the shock velocities in lab coordinates. Uh, another thing that's implicit, remember, is that the the uh, this equation is for steady shock waves and for shock waves. So, but they're also steady. And uh, for non-steady shock waves, you have to use uh, differential equations, which you, we'll get to at a uh, later time in the semester uh, what they are. But we're only dealing with uh, steady shock waves in this part of the course. Now, let's go down to the relief wave. And I'm going to actually have a slide on that. Relief wave or compression waves are not steady waves. That means uh, as they travel, uh, the front spreads out. It doesn't stay as a, like a shock wave as, uh, as a step. Uh, it actually just uh, spreads out and, and changes its shape. So that's a non-steady wave. And uh, sometimes you need uh, the velocity of every element in that wave. For example, if you had a compression wave uh, and you broke it up into little elements, the velocity, well, let me, the velocity of each element along this wave here uh, varies with pressure. So each little element, see if this is, this is pressure in this direction, and we'll say we're going in time this direction. So this wave is going this way. It's a compression wave. It's not, well, it's supposed to have a rise time. Maybe I've made it steeper than I should have. But this is not a shock wave where it's an instantaneous jump. And each element in this wave as it drops pressure, you know, as it goes down, has a different velocity. And that velocity uh, is something you need an equation of state for to do it accurately. So uh, we won't be able to treat those real accurately uh, until we get to the thermodynamics uh, section but we can we can deal with the concepts without knowing that so that's what we're going to do well let's then go ahead and show you that the shock with a rarefaction wave because uh, that's a typical example of, of what we do is that we so here you know here's the shock wave This is the shockwave front, and it stays flat for a while. So this would be like a flyer plate had impacted it. So uh, you have a flat top shock, and then eventually it has to release the pressure. It can't stay up forever. And that's usually a relief wave. And there's a few things to talk about so that you understand that, is that the the this relief wave, the velocity of this little element right at the pressure here travels at a velocity of u particle motion be, that's, that's behind this shock. If, if this is, so the particle motion plus the sound speed, the bulk sound speed if this is a fluid. And the bulk sound speed you have to obtain from uh, some other source. And again, I'm going to review that in this lecture. And you'll find that it's greater than the shock front. So that means eventually this shock release here will eat away. And this, uh, this flat top shock will actually eventually go away. Say if a later time, if you had this, it's going to be like this, where this release wave is catching up with the front. And at some time, it actually was going to get to the front, and it's going to turn into a ramp wave uh, once this back part. Since it is faster than the shock front, uh, it's going to eventually decay this into a, a, a ramp wave. Usually in experiments, when we're trying to measure properties, uh, we try to do all our experiments while this remains flat so that we have a very steady uh, uh, flow and the pressure is constant and the particle velocity is constant. So our accuracy can be very good. For That would be the way you do most experiments, is to make sure that you do them before that attenuation 
uh, this this little the wave back here actually reaches the front up here. So you have a time window that you have to get everything done in. So, and that's part of also understanding and using XT diagrams. Um, well, okay, that's the situation. And to do it accurate, this, this C velocity, the sound velocity, bulk sound velocity here, you need an equation of state. There are a few ways you can do to get a, a few things that are simple that you can get approximate values for that. So if you're not doing a, a uh, XT diagram that has to be, you know, two three percent accurate, but you can allow it to be five or seven percent, uh, you can get that value a lot easier. And and I will show you that in a second. But before I do that, uh, let me go back and remind you that a release wave is along an isentrope, that's a thermodynamic path where the entropy, delta S, the entropy is zero. And that's a, uh, the Hugonio has a change in entropy actually because of uh, its steep sh shock front primarily. Otherwise it's an adiabat also, but, but it does have some. Well, ramp waves, relief waves travel along an isentrope. And it's a different thermodynamic path than the Hugonio, which is what represents a shock wave. But uh, the Hugonio and uh, isentrope are second order to compression, in compression, which means they're pretty close to each other until you get to high compressions. And so this allows you to treat the uh, release wave as a step shock wave but reduces pressure. Uh, this is just an approximation, but uh, it really is what makes uh, impedance matching pretty simple. Otherwise, uh, treating a relief wave would be really hard. So notice that what I've done is I've broken the relief wave into three step shocks, uh, rarefaction shocks. Otherwise, the pressure goes down, not up. And I'm saying, I, what I'm saying is that that's going to approximate that re, uh, Rayleigh line, or not Rayleigh line, the release line. And we can use this approximation in an XT and a PU diagram to get fairly good answers. And this is needed for doing impedance matching. That's why I'm bringing it up right now. But to treat this wave in an XT diagram, Let's just look over here and see how to do that. Uh, first of all, of course, the shock front over here is just a straight line. I'm not going to show boundaries. We've talked about boundaries in the problem. And then there's an area, you know, a flat area. If you're at, at any uh, given uh, time, or, or take a flash x-ray in freeze time, uh, you notice that uh, your, your flat area would remain uh, until a relief wave comes in. So what we're seeing is that as long the distance, you know, from here to here is getting shorter as uh, the slope of the release wave. Remember this release wave back here is going U plus C and it is greater than the shock velocity. So that means the slope is uh, lower and so eventually that release wave is going to catch this shock front and when that happens of course the flat part goes away. There, You can release this all the way to zero pressure and typically, if you're going to do this impedance matching by hand, you use only three release waves. Otherwise, it just gets untractable to do it by hand. The truth is, if it gets more complicated, you have to go to a hydrodynamic code, which will handle all this. Uh, but you don't get the insight. So it's important to tr know how to do this because you get good physical insight on what's happening if you can do the uh, simple problems.
and, and also break them up like this. And so you see what physics is going on, even though it may not be as accurate as a code. Uh, some cases it is, but not always. So you can see then that we're treating these release waves as single lines, which means shock rarefaction waves that drop the pressure. And that means that we can treat, the ultimate thing is that that means that we can treat the uh, shock and the rarefaction the very same way with the Hugonio. Because we're going to assume that the state from, uh, that, that we're going to be able to use the Hugonio Since this is a step rarefaction shock now, we can use the Hugonio to, to find out how the pressure changes from field B to field C. And it will be through the Hugonio. And therefore, we're only using Hugonio impedance matching, which makes it tractable. If we had to go put other curves like isentropes on the PU diagram, uh, you would always have to compute those separately and it would be untractable. So here's where we make an approximation. Impedance matching is approximate, but it can be fairly accurate if you do it right. It could be within a couple percent or one percent. Uh, it, it, it's just a case that you can do it more accurate if you have more uh, relief waves than I'm showing, but it's usually not that worth, it's not worth it because you could go to a hydrodynamic code and, and have it solve the problem. But the real subtle point, it's not subtle, the real important point is that we're going to treat relief waves and shock waves with the Hugonio PU uh, states, PU curves, and uh, get our answers rather than go to isentropes. And that means we use only the Hugonio in some of its, in its reflected uh, mirror image curves, and uh, we can do get the answers again within a few percent uh, by this assumption and uh, that really makes life very easy in uh, easy in the fact that that you can actually sit down and do these uh, impedance matching and come up with you know answers that are easily within 10 percent the right answer and, and if you're real want or careful you can even do better than that probably even less than 5%, but. Okay, I did mention before that uh, in, in the little chocolate, its velocity is, is, uh, is U plus C, and C is the bulk sound speed in a fluid, and that's not part of the Hugonio, or the speed that you measure from the Hugonio. Uh, a lot of times you don't measure the sound speed in an experiment either, but you need it for these XT diagrams. This is the particle motion, of course, behind, uh, in front of the, uh, the uh, release wave, otherwise at the top pressure for that one wavelet, otherwise here. But we need to know the magnitude of C. Well, if you just if you don't need a real accurate solution, but you're needing to uh, sort of design an experiment and set set it up with reasonable values, uh, I've learned that you you could use just a factor of 20% higher for the sound speed. So if you multiply your shock velocity at that same pressure, that where this uh, what where the sound speed is going to be coming through the material at that pressure. Uh, multiply it by 1.2, you're going to be in the ballpark. So that means that's very simple to then use. Of course, it's not going to be totally accurate, but it's going to get you in the right ballpark, for, uh, and it certainly allows you to be, uh, use a, a velocity you know already, and you don't have to go run, it, run a code or get it from derivative of an equation of state. Now for that's the easiest way, but if you need a little better answer than that, you remember there is another way of doing it that I brought up uh, when we did the, uh, the uh, stability arguments of a wave. And let me just point out first is that the definition of bulk sound speed, 
is minus v squared dp dv. And so it, it turns out that uh, the, this then, you just need this, the uh, derivative of the, of the uh, point on an isentrope. That's, that's the definition. So this, this actually turns out to be bulk modulus, by the way, uh, if you remember your moduli. The, the, the V dp dv is bulk modulus, and that's equal to rho c squared. But so all you need then to know is a, what is the slope of the isentrope? Well, of course, the best way is to have an uh, equation of state, go in and do that derivative. But if you remember that slide, and I repeat it here, this, this one, is that we prove for a shock wave to be stable uh, at a point away from the initial conditions, the isentrope has to fall between, at that point, high, at a high pressure point, this is the isentrope, PS, <coughs> the curve on a PV plane, has to fall between the slope has to fall between the Hugonio and the Rayleigh line. The Rayleigh line is always the point from the initial state to the point of pressure. And so that's easy. It's P1 uh, over V naught minus V is the slope. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, if you notice that <coughs> slope of the Hugonio and the so for the Rayleigh line, again, <coughs> I think I've been talking too much. Are all properties of the from the Hugoni or the shock wave? <coughs> so you can take. <coughs> excuse me a minute. I'll <coughs> get my voice back. <clears throat> so if you just take the average of the Hugonial slope and the Rayleigh line, it's going to be close to the slope of the isentrope. <coughs> <clears throat> We're close to break time. It looks like it's good. <laughs> for Not yet, but almost. So... <clears throat> <clears throat> talking so much I got my throat got dry. So this would be one way. Takes a little math. <clears throat> but you could do it. And <clears throat> <clears throat> if you wanted to look ahead, these equations in chapter five would actually give you those slopes. So you could even uh, uh, determine it with, with more accurate equations. <clears throat> if you really decide you need that more accurately than, than up here. <clears throat> OK, one more slide, and then we're going to take a break. Now, the solid. I've talked about fluids right now, <clears throat> but we all know that solids exist, and so uh, we, I, I need to at least tell you that the solid is different because a solid can sustain shear forces in the, the y and z direction where the compression still can be only in the x direction in a solid, which is what a one-dimensional plane shock does. In fluids, that can't, uh, you don't get the shear stress in the opposite directions. Uh, it's, it becomes a hydrostatic. They're all equal. <clears throat> so the fact that you do get strength, this is the strength of a material, or shear stresses, <clears throat> means that that velocity, that release velocity C, now it's, a, it's not a bulk modulus. It's a longitudinal velocity. <clears throat> 
and it's going to be greater than the bulk modulus or the bulk sound speed because of this shear strength. And so you need, you need to have a way of determining what that uh, sound speed in a solid is. We do go over that in, in the second semester. Uh, the same arguments from the waves catching up to the front and using XT diagrams remain the same. It's just that uh, determining that uh, the longitudinal uh, sound speed for a solid is a little more difficult because you have to know the uh, uh, the the, pro the shear stress in the solid. And we're not going to do that in this semester. We're still going to stay with fluids, basically. But I needed to point out to you that if you were trying to do this with a solid, <clears throat> you would find that it'll attenuate, for example, that wave that uh, like this. And I mentioned that this, the velocity of this release wave greater than the U. But if this C happens to be for a solid, it's even much faster. Therefore, the attenuation is much faster. Now, that actually was shown experimentally. That's how it was found, is that you took the bulk sound speed and you calculated how long it would take for this wave, the release wave, to catch up with the front. And you found experiments were showing that, well, it was happening much sooner than the bulk sound speed were, was predicting. Well, then it didn't take much to understand is, oh, well, we do have to treat it as a solid and we have to account for the strength. And, this, and that elastic uh, or the, the shear strength adds a uh, velocity to that longitudinal release stre uh, strength. And so we will treat that in great detail when we come to solids. But So if you're really dealing with a solid, be aware that that attenuation will be faster than what the bulk sound speed would predict. Okay, this is a good time for a break, so uh, let's take a break and, and we'll come back and we'll start on the subject of PU uh, curves. <clears throat> Okay, welcome back. I'm going to review some of the, one of the homework problems is to do a PU uh, principle Hugonio. I'm going to go over. Uh, wait, wait, well, the problem was 2.3, but I'm going to go over that with a few other uh, materials, uh, just because that's going to be very important for you to know that you can get this information. So. Recall that the uh, principal Higonio is where the state ahead of the shock, uh, the pressure and particle velocity is zero, the initial volume is usually V naught. So for linear US relationships, USUP, you get this uh, quadratic that we had mentioned before. And so you can draw this and on a PU diagram. And remember, the reason you want a PU diagram is that that's the Hugonio in ter uh, terms of sp the space where the boundary conditions of a shockwave problem can be placed right on that graph. So that's that's actually the graph we use for, for impedance matching because of that. So <clears throat> again, for solids, we're assuming that the yield point of the solid is really, really uh, uh, small compared to the uh, pressures that we're going to be working with. Uh, therefore, the solids can be treated as a 
fluid as well as just regular fluids like water or other uh, liquids. But uh, you, when you get down to closer to the yield points of solids, that's not true, so you have to treat it as a solid. We're not going to do that in this semester. That, again, is next semester's uh, one of the subjects that we'll treat. But I've already shown you that uh, this is an appendix. Uh, some of the common materials where over the re certain region of pressure, and in this graph I, it's not even shown, but it, the, the caution is that here's a lot of materials, and they show the initial density, which you'll always need. They'll show the, uh, they use the uh, C naught for, uh, uh, re that's an A in our, in our terms. So if I'm trying to be consistent with my terminology, but since this is a uh, graph, this really is A. It's, if there's no curvature, it is equal to the bulk sound speed at zero pressure, but uh, that's why some people put it as C naught. But for the U.S. equal A plus B U B, you can see that, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of materials that are reported as linear. Truth is, is that they're linear over certain regions of pressure, and it's not always stated as even like in this graph. that They usually should have a region, you know, a pressure region where the data was taken. Uh, this is not always done, in fact, it's very seldom done, but you could get into problems, uh, especially in the lower pressure regions, uh, where it tends to be more nonlinear. Uh, most materials do seem to get linear as the pressure goes up, but not all. So the so point is that you can't always say that uh, every material has a linear USUP. And even if you do use linear USUP, it, to be on the safe side, you got to make sure the data was taken in the range of uh, stress that you, or compression, or equivalent, that you're interested in. And that takes a little more detective work on, on your part, and so a lot of people don't do that, and it could cause you some real heartache uh, if you really needed accurate answers. So always be diligent in, in making sure the data you're using uh, is the ac is accurate to the point where you really need it. So, but anyhow, I just thought, okay, <clears throat> we need to get to the point where you're using some kind of graphic program. I use Excel. Um, I know there's others out there. But, uh, so if you wanted to take aluminum, this is really 60, I'm sure this is 60-61-T6. Got cut off there. <clears throat> So it, it gives, here's the linear USUP and initial density of 2.7. And this would be for the pressure, and this is pressure in megabar. And this is the particle velocity in centimeter or microsecond. So this is the kind of curve that the Hugonio represents. <clears throat> now the reason this is important, this curve is where the, uh, the conservation laws agree. So if you have a Hugonio or a shock wave uh, in aluminum, it needs to f uh, ha uh, fall in this point, uh, on this curve somewhere. If it's at that pressure, it's going to have this particle velocity. If, if you have a pressure and a point off this curve, you're not conserving the, uh, the you know, the momentum, energy, and mass. Some, because this is a graphical way of conserving the momentum, the PU diagram. And so all answers on aluminum have to be on a graph like this when you're shocking it. Otherwise, again, you're, you're violating the conservation law of momentum. Another thing that um, you'll see in a problem that we have is that this curve actually can be reflected uh, around a point, a mirror image reflection, 
and uh, it, it actually is part of impedance matching. So here, this curve at initial state uh, 0 and 0, P equals 0, U equals 0, that's, this curve is right here, is the principal hegonial. What you're going to see is that if I wanted, uh, if I have ref shocks reflected off of boundaries and they're going backwards to the right, to the left, and it's in aluminum, I can reflect if, if I'm given the property that this is the point that it's reflecting off of. I can reflect this curve symmetrically. Whoops. It doesn't have a kink in it. And I can use the reflection of these curves. That's actually what we do in impedance matching. These curves, again, this is supposed to be symmetric, mirror image of this. And one reason you can do that is that uh, one of the problems I've mentioned before that er, we've given is that if you have a gas gun and you're throwing a plate, from left to right, and it hits another plate, it generates a certain pressure. If you would rotate the gas gun around 180 degrees and do it again, same velocity, same plate, it'll generate the same pressure. So uh, you can't have the PU curve going from the, le uh, the left to right if your, your waves are going the other way. But these Hugonios still are valid these curves are still what conserves the momentum of, in this case, it's, the curve is, is uh, conserving momentum. For example, let's just say that it was a shock going back, and, and you'll be getting into this later, but in, uh, and it goes to this point. The point is, is if there's a shock going back, it still has to be on this reflected curve from this state where it hit the boundary at that pressure. So otherwise, if your point was over here, again, you're not conserving the momentum. So these curves then tend to allow you to uh, get the right answer for your shock problem, and, but you have to actually end up with states on the curves in some manner. Otherwise, you've, you've not conserved momentum and something's wrong. That's just a little precursor of, of what we're going to be doing. I uh, just thought I would, it'd be, you're going to hear more of that, uh, but it's important that that is what impedance matching is about. And so I mean, knowing that this curve really is the conservation of momentum is, is an important concept. Well, you can take other materials, obviously, uh, and we can talk about their impedance. That's be the thing to do next. Is uh, um, you know tantalum is is a higher impedance material than most, so that's going to be this curve. Aluminum is in the mix here. There's a here's aluminum. It's lower impedance. Remember, impedance is initial density times the shock velocity, and so. Aluminum has two, you know, a lower uh, density than tantalum, and it may also have an initial shock velocity lower, uh, or or close. To, it has to if its impedance mat is down here. Uh, copper and iron actually are close, uh, but this would be copper. The blue line is copper, so it's higher impedance than aluminum, lower impedance than tantalum. Uh, Teflon is is obviously a lower impedance material. Its initial, its density is going to be lower, but it also its initial shock uh, velocity uh, it is uh, like a sound speed is going to be lower. And so that shows you then that the curves that are lower slope in the PU plane are lower impedance. I mean, impedance is part of their equation. Remember. Uh, if you go back, the uh, row U 
rho naught u as impedance. So that's the slope of these curves. Is it's that's the, determines a lot of it. So po the point really is, the low impedance materials takes a. You're not going to get to very high shocks. The pressure is going to be lower. Take as, unless you get tremendous compressions. It's easier to get high pressures in, in materials like tantalum or copper. You can get a megabar, you know, but not with with a reasonable. Uh, this would be a megabar for the for reasonable particle velocity. So from that table, you can just generate these curves, and you'll need to if uh, for the impedance matching problems. So now, with that said. Another thing that has always bothered the students is this difference between disturbance versus lab wave uh, velocities. I think I've mentioned it enough. I hope I'm not boring you and you, you understand it. But uh, it is the one thing that has hung up other people before. And quite frankly, it's hung up people in the field or new to the field. Um, they don't always understand that there's a difference here. <clears throat> so, one of the ways to really illustrate this is a what's called a uh, uh, you know a flyer plate hitting the same material. So, so that's uh, that's an interesting problem because it's symmetric, and so it's called symmetric impact, and. You, you actually know some of the answers before you start. And that, for example, if you have a, a copper plate hitting a stationary copper plate, you know that the uh, pressure in the plate that, it, that is uh, stationary will equal the pressure at the going uh, that's in the pressure in the flyer plate that impacted it. Uh, that's a boundary condition, and for them to stay together, the, the pressure has to be equal across the boundary. <clears throat> but you also know that their densities are the same because they are copper, and so that gives us a way of showing how those two-wave uh, jump equations can actually be useful to you in, in getting the, uh, uh, the actual Eulerian velocity versus a... Uh, lab disturbance uh, velocity, <clears throat> or a, a disturbance velocity in its uh, moving coordinate system. <clears throat> All right, so what are we talking about symmetric impact? Let's use flyer plates. Let's say, let's start with a uh, plate here, and I'm drawing it. I'll just put the boundary here. That's a free surface. I don't need to do that, but I'll do that. <clears throat> and this is uh, time. We're going to do an XT diagram, actually. So this is this is the uh, material two. Let's see if that's what I do here. No. I didn't want to be showing you a problem different than what I have. So this is material one. The flyer plate is material two. Now, what we usually do is pick where the shock or flyer plate hits right at time zero. When it impacts, you take that as time zero and x zero. So the flyer plate is going a certain velocity, and it's got a certain thickness, so it's parallel. So this would be, this is copper, this is the second material is copper, and this is a void, a vacuum. So you see that, okay, this plate impacts here at this time, and again, like I say, we pick that point because that's the best and easiest one to put your coordinate system on. Well, this is going to have a shock wave going to this boundary, 
And of course, it's a free surface, so it's going to reflect back. It's actually going to reflect back as a relief wave, which is three fans. Uh, this boundary is no longer stationary because uh, it's being pushed off to the right, so it actually, this was straight, or straight as I can draw. But now this has a motion of a particle velocity of U free surface. So these are rarefaction waves, but we're treating them as step shocks. Now that's, I got everything too crowded, so let's just say they're relief waves, so we'll just label them R. But they're step relief waves. We're treating them like shocks, but, but uh, going down in pressure. This is the initial shock. Now, the, where this impacts, it, it, the pressure then behind this shock has to equal the pressure behind the shock going back into the flyer plate. And then, of course, there's a release wave here, but I don't want to go into that much detail. <clears throat> but so there's a shock going back to the back side of the flyer plate, which is also a vacuum or a free surface. If you, I guess we could just say it's another free surface or uh, it's in a vacuum. This surface here is fr a free surface. We're not going to go that far into the XT diagram, so we can stop uh, just where, where I stopped here. This is a very unique uh, situation because the particle motion in this, behind this shock and behind this shock are equal due to symmetry. They're the same material. They have the same pressure shock, and it's equal to... This is equal to one half the flyer velocity. So we already know then what the particle velocity is behind uh, the forward facing shock and the backward facing shock. In this case, it's going to be the, the, uh, the same. So uh, it has to be the same for this boundary to be in, in uh, equilibrium. Should also point out that that boundary is not fixed also. Once it's impacted, that boundary moves. Just like the problem we went over. Well, by doing this problem and noting some symmetry, um, this, this is it drawn a little better. I don't draw all the relief waves it's like I don't I didn't put the relief waves here they have to be if this and also here but I mean relief waves would be coming from here too but uh I just wanted to show this much of it The other thing to note is that uh, if you have two plates like this either a plate hitting it or if they were together like the previous example uh, that's why we have X in this direction because, you know, we, we can think of the shock wave in, in going in the X direction as going through plates. And a lot of people uh, still like to reverse it and put time down here, but uh, people that have worked in, in certain laboratories always use X in it for the fact that you lay plates together and send shocks through them. <clears throat> well, in this case, this is the principal Hugonio, the one going from the left to the right from the, from the uh, initial condition P equals zero. So this is initial Hugonio in PU space. And in this case, they're the same material, so that it's a mirror image of 
of this uh, this this curve is going to be the mirror image of this curve, but we know the flyer velocity, and so what we do is do the mirror image through the point where we also know the pressure is going to be the same. And in this case, we're just saying it will be this point. So we reflect the curve around the pressure that's in both plates, the pressure going to the, in the plate to the right and the pressure going to the plate in the left. Are, uh, even in non-symmetric impacts, they're the same. Uh, it's just the Hugonios aren't mirror images. But for, since they are the same, these are mirror images. And so notice that this mirror image is representing a shock that goes into the flyer plate. And it has a different initial state. Its pressure is zero, but its particle velocity is the velocity of the plate. And so that's how you know how to reflect. That's another way of knowing how to reflect this curve is if you know that velocity, you can reflect this curve to tell it this point becomes this point, uh, this point over here. You flip it over, mirror image to this point, and you get this backward facing PU curve. And remember that we have this hierarchy. Uh, to, that allows us to make keep ourselves straight in the XT and PU diagrams. A PU diagram going from left to right will have waves going from left to right, and so all you know, any wave on that curve is we know its direction. It'll be going left to right. And the opposite is true on this other curve. Uh, on a curve going backwards means that the uh, backwards but still concave up. All this represents all way, shock waves that are going to be in the material going from the right to the left. And so that allows us to know on the XT diagram which direction the wave is going to be. And uh, for just one wave or two, that's no problem. But when you get multiple reflections, it starts to get a pro to be a problem, and this will help you uh, determine uh, which wave it has to be and where. So, so this is again a case where now we're using Hugonio that's not a principal Hugonio, in the fact that uh, the reflected flyer plate Hugonio has initial condition of uh, motion or mass velocity of UF. And it does, and it's for uh, shocks going to the left. Well, since the density of the, these two materials are the same material, they're the same, uh, you can see that that's not going to be a problem. But if you notice that the, if we want to know that uh, these uh, there's two ways of getting to this pressure point. Here, uh, P P2. Well, first of all, the single shock goes up this Rayleigh line. And the point Here is, is the uh, pressure, P1. So this is that, uh, I'm sorry, it's P2. I, I've gotten myself confused from the, this, this is the, yeah, it says P2 here. So this is the equation that defines that Rayleigh line, slope rho u times the particle velocity. But the reflected Rayleigh line here, is the two-wave equation, but remember the second P is zero down here because it's, you know, PI minus PI naught, but PI naught is zero, so that goes out. And so we get this equation, 
And where they cross, they have to be the same. So P2 and uh, uh, P1 uh, have to be the same because they're symmetric reflections. And we know that in this case because they're the same material. And we also know, and I showed you that the flyer velocity is twice the particle velocity at this point, at this point here, where the two curves are re, uh, reflected around that point. And we know that row one and row two are the same, and pi. Therefore, a quick, uh, simple solution is then the Eulerian velocity minus the flyer velocity in, uh, you, in the uh, plate one, that's, you know, that's the flyer plate, has to equal minus the uh, shock velocity in, in the stationary plate. Just due to the symmetry in solving the, uh, setting these two equations. Well, that means that for these equations to be valid then, that ui is equal to minus u2i, which is again the principal velocity, uh, plus uf. So this tells you what the Eulerian velocity of the this wave, I mean the wave that goes to this point along the, this uh, backward Rayleigh line. Let me think it's important. This Rayleigh line, let me do the felt pin to this point. So that shock velocity going backwards is not the same amplitude, I mean, it's not the same velocity because it's a, it's a vector. Uh, it's actually minus u2, which is the positive, u, is the positive shock velocity going from left to right. So this is a positive number, u2 is positive, so minus, so with the minus sign in it, this gives u1 as a minus value, but you have to subtract the particle velocity or the flyer velocity. Remember that, that makes sense really. This, so I, all I've done is solve this to show you uh, what the shock velocity going from right to left is. Because we know the, you know, it's the principal one, the one going from left to right, that's the one we all understand and, and uses our bases. But they're not the same uh, velocities. You can see from, from down here. Well, it does make sense if you think about it, is that if you're on, if you're looking at the shock wave going back into the flyer plate, the mass motion coming towards that shock wave is the particle, I mean, is the flyer velocity. And so to put that in Eulerian coordinates, you have to uh, add or subtract. And in this case, it's, you're actually, that's a plus particle velocity. Uh, so, and your, your wave is negative, but the flow is, uh, particle velocity is going uh, to the right. So you actually have this equation. And, and it's a positive value that you have to, uh, essentially, uh, since this is a negative number, you have to subtract from or, or you have to adjust. So that that number, that velocity going from the right to left is much smaller or slower in the Eulerian coordinates than the velocity going from left to right. That's another way of saying it. It's like the train, the, uh, observing the runner on the train uh, again. Uh, this is where this is, analogy comes up directly. So that the velocity uh, going from right to left in the flyer plate is going to have a lower magnitude in Eulerian coordinates than the shock wave going from the left to the right. And it's going to be actually lower in, uh, by the, the flyer plate, which is the mass motion in this case, because all of the flyer plate's mass points are coming to the same velocity.
So what we've done then is, is proven that we have to adjust for particle velocity in front of a shock wave in order to put it in the Larian coordinate system. And so this was just another way of showing that the, the equations for the jump equations uh, actually show you and to show you what the magnitude will be. You can actually use them to determine this. So if you get into a situation where you're confused whether, uh, you know, am I adding or subtracting, uh, you, you can do a simple little thought problem like this to make sure you get it right. So that, so the main thing is that the pressures have to be equal, you know, otherwise uh, the plates can't be, the, uh, cannot be staying together. I mean, it's a boundary condition that's, that the pressure, once a flyer plate hits that boundary, pressure on both sides of the boundary you have to be, has to be equal, at least at early time. So. so you could even go further and here use the same argument for uh, a plate symmetric impact and, and use copper. So if you used a flyer plate of copper just to give you numbers, put numbers on it. Uh, what if you had a flyer plate that's going pretty fast? That's 0.2766 centimeter to microsecond. That's really pretty fast. And uh, but from homework 2.2, we know this is, puts about 200 kilobars or 0.2 megabars of pressure in, uh, going to the right. And another way, uh, wave going to the left, it has to be 200. Uh, uh, kilobars uh, behind that shock, and the the shock going t uh, to the left to right in that problem was 0.6 centimeter microsecond, and we ask, okay, what is U1? Well, again, we just do what we did. Here's the uh, here's the equation. So you just substitute it in. Is it points minus 0.6? Minus 0.6 goes here, plus the flyer plate velocity. And, you know, you get that the, the shock going from the right to left is actually going at minus 0.3 centimeter microsecond. And the shock going from left to right is going 0.6, you know, like, like we said. Because you have to account for the mass flow in the pressure equation so they come out equal. That's how this all came about, which is what we derived. So again, here shows you that in this situation, if you had a copper flyer plate, just summarizing it, impacting a stationary copper plate, then it'll be 200 kilobars. That was a problem that we, you worked, a homework problem. But the shock velocities are different in magnitude in the Larian coordinates because of the motion of the fl uh, flyer plate. And it's simply that the shock velocity that goes forward upon impact in the stationary plate is like 0.6 centimeter microsecond, but the shock wave that's going backwards along this Rayleigh line is only minus, and it has to be minus because it's going right to left. If it wasn't, then the wave had to go the other way. Uh, is, but it, it's down to 0.3 centimeter microsecond. So, it, uh, where's, why is this important? Because it's all going to come out if you keep the pressure equation fine in the XT diagram. Uh, because the XT diagram is where you, you use these Eulerian coordinates when you do the slopes in the XT diagram. And so, you know, you're going to have quite different slopes for those two shocks. And so that will change where, where the ra wave's locations are in time. And again, that's what you need to know if you're an experimentalist and you're setting up uh, a gauge experiment or even a camera experiment where you may not have unlimited time. You have maybe a short window to collect your data. And you have to make sure your XT diagrams are accurate, otherwise you're going to miss the data. You don't want to do that too often because shock experiments are expensive. And so just by 
doing due diligence and, and doing the XT diagram ahead of time, uh, you'll catch yourself uh, from making a mistake just from intuition, uh, which, which can happen just because you do it one way and it got away with it for a while. You, the problem may have changed, so make sure that, that you have done the XT diagram and the PU diagram. Very useful for people working with shock waves. Okay. Now, not all flyer plates are, and, and, and impact plates are the same, of course. So that's called non-symmetric impact. So here's an example of a copper flyer impacting a aluminum target. And the, fly, uh, the copper is going at 0.2766 centimeters. So now what are the values for U1, U2? How would you f find those values? Well, here's, here's the impedance problem in a PU diagram is that we've already done the XT diagram. So, so here is the principal Hugonio of aluminum. Let me, and let's go back and remember that the, in this case, the flyer, this is copper. Let me, let me label that. That's probably a useful thing. Since the, this, this is the flyer, this is copper, and this is aluminum. So the, the, uh, the shock going from left to right in aluminum is going to be the prince, along the principal Hugonio, this one. But the Higonio for the copper is, again, is a reflection of the copper principal Higonio, which, by the way, uh, is a higher impedance. So it would be something like this. And it would be centered around, you know, this would be copper principal, just to show you. And then you'd reflect it around here, but you don't need to know that it reflects around there because you already know the flyer plate is here. What you need to know is that this is a mirror image. Uh, we're just reflecting the copper Hugonio. So I'll leave it on there because that's what you're really doing. You can either do that mathematically or you can do it graphically. Um, you know, if you turn a, if you have two graphs with the same uh, principal Hugonio, you turn one upside down lay, and they're you can see through them. You lay them on top of each other and line them up. You have done a mirror image reflection. Uh, so you can do it by hand very quickly, but you can mathematically do that too. Okay. Well, that means here's the flyer plate velocity. And this then is that reflected Hugonio. So what we know is that the point here is one pressure, so they're equal pressure, because uh, that's what we're showing here on the PU diagram. Well, if they're equal pressure, there's only one point that can be. And that's, uh, remember, they, the solutions have to be on lunum along this line, you know, along the lunum principal Hugonio, along this line. But the solution for copper has to be along uh, this line. Well, there's only one place where that, uh, that satisfies both materials. So remember, both have the same pressure at that point. There's only one point. Of course, that's no mystery, is it? It's, it's where they cross. And that means you conserve momentum in both materials. And now you have the solution of what that pressure would be for that flyer plate. Uh, Pressure in, in aluminum would be, you know, 400, 0.404 megabar, 404 kilobars. And it's also, that's the pressure that's behind, is in, in the uh, shock going backwards in the copper also. So that is actually impedance matching. <clears throat> 
what we just did here. So it's, it just is a case that we're applying these rules and there's a few things we need to learn that you can do a mirror image and you can actually move, you know, this, this eugonio can be moved depending on the boundary condition. If the flyer plate was moving a little faster, you know, you, this, this could have been over here and then you would have had a eugonio which will be parallel to this one. It's just slipped over to the right. You just moved it to the right. If this would be the, the another flyer velocity, say you, you fired it again and you, you got this velocity out of your gun, uh, you know, 0.3 almost, uh, then the answer has to be along this, you know, this Hugonio, backward facing Hugonio. So as you move the velocity of the gun, you get different pressures in the aluminum, which makes sense, of course. So now, with a higher velocity in the gun, you get a higher velocity and in, in higher pressure in the aluminum, uh, which is, in, that's intuitive. So, uh, So, there we've used actual numbers. So that's why I, before I plotted the PU diagrams off of the linear USUP so that we can actually get to the point where we can use these uh, curves and, and, and real numbers. I mean, not just cartoons, which is what I call them when you don't put uh, numbers on them. But this gives you the real uh, answers of what, if you do an experiment, what, what actually occurs in the experiment. Or at least within one or two percent, it should be that. So that, <clears throat> actually that's pretty simple, I think. Uh, it can get more complicated uh, the more waves that you have reflecting off of boundaries. So we're going to go through that uh, probably next lecture, we're going to start on some of that. But I just thought this simple first problem would be uh, something worth showing you with real numbers so that you can see that it's, I'm just not drawing on, on a blank piece of paper and, and not getting any real answers. So uh, this is just going over, you know, the, the, uh, the velocity that you would get for the, uh, in the, in the, uh, flyer plate, just like we did before. It's the same thing we did, so I'm not going to spend the time on it. You, you can look at that and go through it yourself and see that that's, that's the velocity that would be in, in the um, flyer plate in, in the Eulerian coordinates. Okay. Actually, I think this, um, this, this is easy to do. I probably should have done this before I showed you the other one, but, but it's okay. I can do this. I'm not going to do it with real numbers. I'm just going to show you. Well, actually, I sort of did before. But it was a symmetric impact, but the drawing there is the same when you don't put numbers on it. You know, you, you have a flyer plate. It's got to be parallel. This is a void. So if this is supposed to be straight down. The flyer plate is closing and impacts here. And so if this would be copper, then, you know, and this, this would be aluminum. You know, this, if we wanted this to be five millimeters here. So you get a shock here and a shock here. But remember, this boundary moves, so really we should have only drawn it up to here. And then the boundary moves. And this has a shock. This is a free surface. It would be a fan. And the same back here, actually, because that's a free surface also. We actually went over this on the symmetric problem. So... Um, it, it from the XT diagram, they really look the same. It's only when you put the numbers in, the slopes are different. And so it, that's all that 
it's really showing. Uh, again, this is not even showing a boundary out here, but this is the same problem that I just drew. So I, I'm not going to uh, do any more than show you that, you know, I do show the material interface and how it moves after impact. Uh, you have to know that and you have to always take that into account. Uh, this is the solution to that. And again, what I've done is um, here's the flyer plate. Let me get a good color here. Here's the flyer plate coming in. Whoops. So now I'm actually doing it with real numbers. It's impacting. And so it, it has a shock going to the right in the aluminum. In this case, we're hitting it hard, so the, uh, the interface is really uh, fairly fast and, and not slow. That's one reason for this problem you wanted uh, to definitely put it in there. And here's your reflected wave, or into the, not reflected, it's just the impact wave into the flyer. And you can see here's the back side of the flyer and so I have to take that into account. When I do that and graph these lines, I can get the answers to where they intersect. Where, the, For example, when this, uh, this shock going back into the flyer reaches the back side of the flyer, notice that I had to account for the flyer continuing. That back side does not know that the shock's coming, so it can, keeps moving to the left to right. The flyer does. So, you have to take that motion, that slope, and where this line intercepts it, uh, that's the answer. Well, it intercepts it at minus 0.236 centimeters in your Larian coordinates and about one, uh, 0.97 microseconds. So, and, and these are just the intercepts for, for this uh, boundary, of, uh, which is five millimeters. But so. That's just another uh, picture with showing that you can actually do the real, the real thing. The advantages of doing the is uh, PU the impedance matching is really that it gives you a better understanding of the problem. Even if you're running a hydro code for shock problems, I recommend uh, doing both of these. Uh, the XT and PU diagram first, and then run your code because you'll you'll have a good answer within a f certainly better than 10 percent typically, and so the hydro code will only give you more accurate answers uh, for actually more complicated problems usually. Uh, so you would know the physics of it if you do the XT PU diagram. A lot of times I see uh, people will run the hydro codes. And their answers are totally out of the order of magnitude they could be. And so for that, in that case, you have to really uh, realize they didn't do or don't understand the shock physics. They can put the input and run a code, but that's it. So uh, the, the first is relief waves can be approximated three or more. One thing, so keep in mind things we, we're going to do. This is going to be our last slide for today. But keep in mind, two approximations are used in this impedance uh, thing. Simple and accurate for small compressions. Uh, that's something to keep in mind. First, relief waves can be approximated by three or uh, more step shocks, allowing you to use the Hugonio. Second, the segments of a principal Hugonio can be used for the shocks where, when the initial state is not the P0, U0. Essentially, that's where we did the reflection. You can start from a different point and still use that Hegonio and get the answer. So I think this is a good time to uh, uh, stop this lecture, and we'll pick it up and, and uh, uh, keep working on this uh, on the lecture number four. So uh, we'll see you the next time.